so tonight um we've got a small group which is never a bad thing because it makes it a little maybe a little bit more informal and folks can interject and ask questions as we move through this but dr Kalfleisch tonight is going to visit with you all a little bit about uh, yak genetics now and in the future and um, I'm, I'm hoping that this will be something that we can use in the future in the webinar series uh, as we think about you know trying to manage some of our issues with genetic diversity and that and some of the discussions around Greg's project with artificial insemination and how that might be a tool in the future to be able to kind of mitigate some of these challenges on genetic diversity. So Dr. Kalfleisch is going to visit with you all and I'm going to turn it over to you, Ted. You should be able to share screen at any time. Okay, so um, uh, you know, yak genetics now and into the future. What? <clears throat> so I I got into this. Um, I don't know. Maybe it was uh, maybe it was as many as eight or so years ago uh, with uh, Doctor Mike Heaton and uh, Doctor Jessica Peterson, and uh, the issues that uh, that that folks were seem to be interested in now uh or or seem to be interested then um uh, are i believe the ones that uh that remain uh uh of interest uh specifically is there uh is there a, a recent admixture of cattle in the pedigree can we assess parentage accurately and uh uh because there are um you know uh because the founders of uh, of North American yak were so few, uh, can we uh, maintain healthy genetic diversity uh, in the herds that uh, that we've got across uh, all the animals that we have uh, in North America? So, in order to do all of this, you need to be able to sequence or genotype the DNA. And historically, this has been a problem uh, just because it's been too expensive. And uh, oftentimes there have been no, uh, there haven't been resources. So, um, uh, you know, the human genome was published in, say, 2000 and uh, uh, in the year uh, 2000. Uh, but uh, cattle didn't have a decent reference genome until 2006, 2007. <laughs> and it wasn't clear that uh, animals like the horse would ever get one, um, uh, let alone uh, let alone yak. Um, but uh, the price of the technology has come down uh, and uh, our capabilities uh, with uh, with these technologies have have increased pretty dramatically. And uh, one of those great successes, and and uh, this is something that uh, your community should be, I think, uh, very proud of. Uh, the at, there there was a time, uh, and uh, it lasted a couple of months to maybe a year, where uh, the yak genome was the most contiguous, the most high quality reference genome of any species in existence and that includes humans um this was work that was done uh by uh uh by a uh, bright young fellow uh, by the name of ed rice uh he was the uh, he was the postdoc who was who was driving all of this and uh scientists uh tim smith and jessica peterson uh were the um uh were the uh academic and government scientists uh, who were responsible for designing the project and, and generating all of the data. Uh, but uh, uh, this was uh, uh, this was an incredible feat and has given you uh, as solid a foundation as any um, uh, as any people in uh, who are doing agricultural research or production research uh, for um, uh, or, or, or uh, research aimed at improving production in agricultural animals. So, Ted, when you mentioned that the cost has come down, can you give us a rough idea, like in 2000, what the cost would have been compared to today? 
Yeah, and so uh, at the end of the Human Genome Project, uh, it had cost two point three billion dollars uh, to generate uh, the genomic sequence that we could generate today for six hundred. And the uh, data that we can generate today for six hundred dollars is much higher quality than uh, they were able to generate then, uh, and is much more informative than what they were able to generate then. Um, this process of actually building building complete genomes for animals that's still a little bit expensive, uh, where you know to where it would probably cost in the, in the neighborhood of twenty or so thousand dollars to do. But again, um, you know. Uh, just, uh, I guess, five years ago, I published the um, uh, the horse reference genome, and that cost us $150,000. And we were starting from, you know, uh, uh, standing on a, a pile of data that had cost $200,000. So, um, yeah, the, 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 the costs continue to plummet, uh, but they're still not low enough uh, for a... Um, uh, for any, uh, you know, just any farmer to say, hey, you know, um, I, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to send my, uh, my herd, my, you know, this year's full crop, I'd like to send their DNA to be sequenced. Well, that, that would still cost you $600 a head. That would still be too expensive. Um, <clears throat> so, um, you know, nevertheless, if, if there are, you know, if there are, you um, research questions that that would need to be uh, uh, answered where you have maybe four or five head who have a particular uh, from a, a pedigree that have a particular problem. Um, this is money that you might consider spending to get an answer right to to identify a genetic cause of a particular disease. So six six hundred dollars a head would will get you through, uh, you know, will will get you closer to an answer may not get you there. Uh, but it'll get you closer. Um, and uh, as I say here in the slide, this is the most common, uh, uh, the common tool, this, you know, uh, spending $600 to sequence an individual. Um, you know, that that's what we do when we do re uh, medical research in humans. That's what we do when uh, we do uh, research in horses, uh, cattle, uh, wh whatever. Uh, but again, we wouldn't think to use this uh, to monitor genetic diversity uh, uh, for example, in a full crop. Uh, the, <coughs> the gene seek yak parentage test. Now this, this was something that, uh, that, uh, um, uh, Mike, uh, Jessica and I developed, and I don't remember how many years ago that was, uh, but it's essentially a panel that's, that's been whittled down to about 87 good markers, uh, trilolic SNPs that we can use for parentage and to assess uh, cattle integration, um, and it does the job pretty well. Um, the next uh, iteration of technology, and one that I'm, I'm uh, hope that uh, I've got a little bit of money in an SBIR phase two grant uh, that uh, I, <laughs> I can point at this, is to try to develop a test or a um, a, a database that could support what's called low pass sequencing. Um, that's where um, you would do the same sort of sequencing that you would do at the the six hundred dollar level, but you do a lot less of it, and you use information that you've gathered, uh, what what we would refer to as haplotype information that you've gathered from sequencing a whole bunch of yak, to do what's called imputing um, genotypes, whole genome uh, for the uh, for the yak, and what this can do, and and this is this is something that works uh, really very well in cattle. Uh, right now, where you can genotype uh, maybe 20 million uh, SNPs, SNP positions for about $50 a head. And there's a lot that you can do with that information. And um, I very much want to uh, move us to a place, move Yak to a place where they can use skim sequencing uh, for uh, uh, to monitor genetic diversity. Uh, uh, across North American yak, and, and Ted, I think that that low pass you, you mentioned eighty seven SNPs versus say twenty forty million SNPs. You know, a lot of our traits may be controlled by more than one allele. Correct? I mean, it's correct. multiple positions. 
In, in, indeed. And you will need that kind of information across a whole bunch of animals. And I'm I'm talking hundreds here uh, in order to assess some of the more complex traits. Um, yeah, it, it's it's uh, it, it, and the uh, so uh, and something that I, I believe we we had made clear at the time and we haven't talked about it much since. But those 87 markers that we chose, um, we chose them uh, because they weren't associated with anything that we knew, uh, because we 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 didn't <clears throat> we we knew that it was a new technology. We knew that there were some people who might have di some difficulty embracing it, and what we didn't want to have happen was you know us put out a test that would that that might suggest that somebody's animal had a bad genetic condition right um you know we we did not want this this test to create winners or losers uh we we just wanted it to accurately catalog what the genetic composition of uh, of each animal was Okay, so um and and this is this is probably something that's a little a little too rudimentary for uh uh for for this crowd um but uh you know a, a quick lesson in in uh this is cattle genetics i i stole this slide from another presentation i gave sorry I, it it works just as well in yak genetics um where um you've got a sire and a dam and each of them has a set of chromosomes that they inherited from um their sire and uh their dam and <clears throat> they might have I don't know, four calves. Um, and the the genetic material uh, from uh, uh, from their sire and dam will essentially get shuffled into the chromosomes, uh, shuffled in a novel way uh, into a chromosome that will get passed to uh, each calf, right? So every animal is going to be a little bit different, but all of that genetic material will have come from the sire or the dam. Uh, they're going to get half of it, exactly what part of, you know, half of it, it is they got, that's, uh, that, that's all chance. Okay. Um, <laughs> the nature of the problem with maintaining genetic diversity is that, um, you want to keep bad traits at bay. So, right. Why do we have breed associations to begin with? Or why do we have breeds, right? There, there are certain traits that uh, have been identified that are desirable, right? And you want to fix those in a certain group of animals so that, you know, you have animals that are all kind of the same way in the way that you like. Um, so what you do is you you essentially breed them until those traits, until uh, the genes that are responsible for those traits are, are uh, constant and consistent across uh, all of the animals in that breed. And that's a good thing. Um, but the uh, uh, there are some bad alleles that can that can that can ride along with that process. And you know so so a a, a general rule, um, some people will give me some pushback on this, but but you know, by and large, it's true. Good traits are dominant, right? So if you if you inherit just one, if you inherit a gene from either your mother or your father that has a, that that has a good gene on it, that good trait will 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 manifest itself. If you inherit, uh, uh, so bad traits tend to be recessive, meaning that if you only inherit um, the uh, uh, one allele from uh, your mother or your father of the bad allele, um, that is not going to manifest. Right, you'll you'll be fine. You have to inherit two copies of the bad allele in order for it to um uh to 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 affect you phenotypically. So if this sire and this dam, uh, uh, each of whom have a good allele and a bad allele, uh, one one copy of each, if they have four calves, um, you know, uh, the 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 way that the math will likely work out, and this is just you know based based on probabilities. One in four of those calves is going to inherit both uh, good alleles. Uh, two of those calves are going to inherit one good and one bad allele. And one of those calves is going to inherit two bad alleles, right? So that if, if, if this is a lethal allele, 
then you know that that calf will uh will will uh will, will simply uh, uh die if it's if it's embryonic lethal it will die uh, at the embryonic stage uh or if it's you know just really nasty it'll it'll be it'll be calved and and will be something that the the farmer will know that they need to move on from um <clears throat> so hey, what, yeah is this also um like why we see coi high in some offspring and low in others of like a bull and cow that aren't necessarily related mm -hmm. yep um okay. yeah just the roll the roll of the dice uh can get you uh can can uh can make a calf uh look uh uh more inbred than uh than its parents yep Yep. Um, Ted, uh, I had a question that came in today from one of our members that said that they've had a concern and they had to put a calf down again. This is the second calf from the same dam and sire mating due to contracted tendon issues. Very similar to what we would see in the, on the Angus side that we know is a genetic issue, but contracted tendons are a bit of a challenge because it can be nutrition too fast to growth in the last trimester it can be exposure to toxins like lupines and others but there's also a genetic component of that that we know of in the angus breed uh so that's known to be an autosomal recessive trait in the angus breed mm -hmm. um that's exactly what you're talking about here in like this calf four right yep that, that that's exactly right that's exactly right. and and these were yak that were put down this is yes these are yaks and um uh this is the second time from the exact same mating sire and dam that the the calf was like that so that i mean and you know i i talked about uh there being some animals that it might be worth uh, spending the 600 dollars to sequence this could be one of them and and in that case you need sire dam and progeny correct that that would be desirable, yes. Yep. And and as many other healthy yak as you can get to compare them. Okay, so how do we use these data? Um, so uh, uh, often, uh, you know, one my my job with with us yak um, means that uh, I get to run the parentage reports. So, so how does all of that work? So here's uh, here's an example where we've got a calf that their genotypes are shown in the middle, and uh, I've got um, you know two sires that uh, that that are candidates to have been the the sire of of uh, of this animal, uh, and I've got their genotypes list, listed to the left and to the right of of the calf. So if we look at uh, SNP one, the calf is homozygous for an A. Both uh, sire one and sire two are homozygous for A's as well. So this particular SNP gives us no no good information um, to uh, to either include or exclude uh, uh, the well. It gives us information to include, but not to exclude uh, either sire. If we look at SNP two uh, uh, at SNP two, we see that sire one is heterozygous AC. The calf is homozygous CC. And the second sire is homozygous AA. Now, um, if these genotypes are in fact accurate, there is no way that sire two could have produced that calf. This, so that genotype is an exclusion. Now, we we know that uh, it's possible that there are some errors in the uh, in the genotyping process, and we allow for that. Uh, the errors that you uh, most commonly see are what are called allele dropouts, where an animal is actually heterozygous, but a genotype's homozygous for one one allele or the other. <laughs> and we see um, uh, we we will see uh, this this error um, uh, sometimes in uh, in the yak data where there is a sire that uh, that that makes uh, that produces a, a great many calves. And uh, the calves will will have one exclusion, and it will always be the same SNP. Um, so we can we can look at that and we can say, yeah, that that one's probably a little dropout. That's probably an error in the the sire's genotype. 
uh, and and we could go back and if we have enough data, we could we could go back and we could address that problem. But um, in our eighty seven um, SNP panel uh, that we use, if you take two unrelated yak um, uh, and uh, were to uh, try to do the parentage uh, um, uh, a, a parentage test of one unrelated yak uh, on another, uh, what you would typically see is about eight exclusions out of the 87, right? So the, the allele frequencies of the polymorphisms that we've chosen are sufficiently high that we can get about that many exclusions um, uh, for, uh, for any pair of unrelated animals. Oops. Okay, so uh, we had talked about this a, a, a little while ago, where um, if you go all the way back to 2000, it cost $2.3 billion to sequence a genome. 2007, that number had dropped all the way to a million dollars, which was, you know, pretty good, uh, but still not low uh, as low as we needed it to be. Uh, by 2020, we were at about $670. Uh, today, that's dropped another 10%, and it's down... Um, it's down around six hundred dollars, uh, but with low pass sequencing in uh, in cattle, um, it costs about forty dollars to generate whole genome genotypes, and that's pretty darn good. And that 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 is uh, where I want to get you all. All right, so um, this is. Um, uh, this is a paper that I had nothing to do with, but uh, it had a pretty picture and I thought it made a good case. Um, if, uh, there, if there is a genetic signature that you are looking to get to in YAK. Um, so here, for example, um, we have several breeds of, of cattle that were um uh that were sequenced and um th this is called a principal component analysis and essentially what you do is you use all the genotypic information that you have uh that you've generated in this um uh, in the sequencing studies uh, across all of these animals each one of these each different point represents a different animal and you add and and uh there there is software that can identify what are called segregating genotypes, right? So genotypes that um uh that suggest an animal is more Yakut than Angus, more Angus than Holstein. And uh, essentially with that information, you can derive a genetic distance between each of the these animals and uh, uh, and the others. Um, so you know when you uh, when you ultimately have enough yak that you can do this sort of thing with, um, you can identify other yak uh, that can move you uh, in a direction uh, closer to uh, the, the 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 genetics that you want to see in in your animals. So, you know, for example, um, you know, based on, uh, uh, you know, pedigree traits, um, you know, you have animals that uh, you think uh, are most likely to represent the genetics of, of the animals that you like. Um, uh, again, this was, a, this was a slide that was developed for, for folks uh, who were sequencing longhorns that I didn't change all the words on. Um, but, um, you can imagine that you've got yak, um, you know, so all of the yak that you've sequenced previously and analyzed would fall neatly into this circle. These X's uh, represent this year's crop of calves, and you've got highland cattle over here, and you've got bison uh, over here. Um, if uh, you can identify other anim other sires, uh, perhaps, or, or dams within this circle uh, that you can cross uh, your uh, your calves that are outside the circle, you can move them. Uh, you can move uh, their progeny closer to uh, the um, uh, the genetic signature of 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 yak. And you know how how does this work? I I I don't. I guess I don't need to explain this um, uh, so much to this crowd. 
but uh, if you cross a um, uh, if you cross yak with with cattle, um, uh, the 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 progeny is going to be one half uh, half of the 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 genetic composition of that animal is going to be cattle. The other half is going to be yak. You cross it with uh, you cross that animal with another yak, and you're going to lose about half of those cattle genes. And you cross it with another yak, you'll lose half of those, and so on and so on. That by the third time you've done a cross, you're down to about one. You've you've purged all but a sixteenth of those cattle genes. And with every subsequent cross with a yak, uh, you are going to continue to have that number. Um, so um, you know that's uh, uh, um, that's relatively well understood. With the genetic data that we've got. Um, we can identify animals that would complement, right? So uh, you'll, you'll you'll notice that uh, um, over here, I've got approximately, right? Um, so first generation, yeah, those are, um, uh, you know, those are, uh, those animals are one half cattle, one half yak. Uh, the, the B1 here will be approximately one quarter cattle. You know, it's going to be upper, you know, it could be a little bit higher, a little bit lower than one quarter. And this too is going to be approximately one eighth and approximately one sixteenth. Um, but with the technology that we've got, we can identify another yak uh, as a potential mate uh, that can move um, uh, the, the, uh, the yak calf or the progeny of the yak calf um, most quickly um to uh to to the genetics of of um uh, of of yak that you're looking for so you know how do we do this um we can um uh, so essentially we can simulate uh the transmission of of genetics to um to a a, a new generation so you know, let's imagine that you've got here, you've got a dam, you've got a, a sire one, you've got sire two here. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so if uh, this dam is homozygous for an A and this sire is homozygous for A, their calf is going to be 100, you know, 100 percent. Uh, there is uh, um, no other way about it. That calf is going to be homozygous A. If uh, the dam is heterozygous CT and the sire is homozygous TT, then there's a 50% chance that that calf is going to be heterozygous CT and a 50% chance that that calf is going to be uh, homozygous TT. And similarly, if the uh, uh, if both the sire and the dam are heterozygous at a given position, then there's a 50% chance that the animal is going to be heterozygous and a 50% a, a chance that it's going to be either homozygous A or homozygous G. Um, and if uh, the dam is GG and the sire is CC, then there is a 100% chance that that animal is going to be heterozygous at that, uh, that particular position. Okay, so um, with by knowing the genetics of, of the dam and of potential sires for that dam, uh, you can predict what uh, uh, probabilities for the heterogeneity of uh, the calf that's produced. So for example, in, in this case, um, uh, the if if what you're doing is is looking to uh, create uh, or create the most genetic diversity, uh, then um, uh, sire two would be your choice. Excuse me, because uh, it is going. Uh, it has uh, two positions where it is going to cre create um, heterozygote, and two positions where it may create a heterozygote. Uh, whereas uh, the mating with sire one will um, not create a, a heterozygote um, in uh, in one position. And, and Ted, just to clarify that, I mean the mm -hmm. desire is to maximize heterozygosity, and right. Yes. Yep. So if 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 that is uh, if that is your goal, um, then this is this is how you do it. And essentially, with the eighty-seven markers that we we have, let's 
let's imagine that um, we have uh, two animals, a sire and a dam, a potential sire and a potential dam. And, um, you know, using the, the math that, um, uh, that, that I was just showing you, let's imagine that we have 13 opposing homozygotes where, you know, uh, the, the uh, sire is homozygous A and the, the uh, dam is homozygous G. Um, every one of those is going to be a het. Or, you know, so, so you're going to get 13 heterozygotes. And then you've got 54 sites that have at least one heterozygote. So you, you can predict that you're going to get about 27 of those. And um, so if you, if you, you know, do lots of simulations or uh, you, you learn pretty quickly that what you get is a binomial distribution that's more or less centered around, um, th that's going to be centered around uh, this position, that is the number of guaranteed uh, heterozygotes that you get, plus half the number of the heterozygotes that you could get. Uh, and that, you know, distribution uh, for 87 SNPs is going to look something like this, where um, uh, you're most likely going to get 40, um, uh, oops, excuse me, 40 um, uh, heterozygotes uh, with a, uh, you know, range where you, you're going to get at least 30, um, uh, but at most maybe uh, 40, uh, 48 or 49 uh, in this example. And here's... Uh, uh, and the, go back, Ted, can you kind of make that comment at the top there that choose the sire that that's really yeah. what you're wanting to do is push it toward that 49, right? Yep. Or, or push it as far, push it, you know, as far to the right as you can. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, it, it, and, you know, I've, I've never really known the right way to talk about this, but, you know, my, my sense is that you find 10 bulls maybe that you like, right? And if you want to make, if you want to create the greatest genetic diversity in the calf that you're going to produce, you would find that bull that pushes this curve furthest to the right whichever that one is. Okay, and here's an example of where we did that with uh, with Longhorn. And this was using um, uh, data from a skim sequencing uh, run that we had uh, we had done. And uh, you can see here that there's, you know, a broad distribution of, of, uh, uh, of uh, predicted heterozygosity for the calf. Those curves are pretty wide. Um, and, uh, you know, so not a huge difference, but you know, hey, if if you're a if you're managing baseball, um, and uh, you have the choice, and, and you know, you you've got a uh, you're you're down by uh, you're down by a run, you've got a runner on second. Are you going to pick the batter that's got a 350 batting average, or are you going to pick the batter that's got a 200 batting average? Right? You're going to pick the you know each both of them could strike out. The guy who bats 200 could could knock one out of the park, but you're going to play the averages. You're going to put in the 350 hitter. Um, and um, uh, essentially what this is doing is um, uh, telling you which animal is going to give you uh, um, the greatest likelihood to produce uh, a, a calf with, uh, with the greatest genetic diversity. Okay, so that's that's all I've got for you all tonight. I'm happy to answer uh, answer questions as long as you all can think to ask them. And and Ted, and, and like this example, just to clarify, so if if you were going for, you know, if you had you mentioned ten, but let's just say we had three bulls, and we narrowed it down that phenotypically these were the ones that we were looking at. Mm -hmm. Um how can i then take in the yak breed or the yaks and and knowing that we've got two different kind of registrations how can i find out this information for yak specifically well so so the the match a yak program that um that that you all have have put together this is what that does and um what so you know, and it's doing it with an 87 marker panel, which is going to be kind of good, uh, but not as good as it uh, as it could be. All right, it, once we get to whole genome genotypes, it will be uh, it will be better. 
And so what I can do then is I can take those three that I've narrowed it down to and run a simulation for the the cows in my herd. Yep. And I'm looking for bulls that would push that average to the right. Correct. Correct. And, you know, so uh, you all are doing AI now. Uh, take a, uh, you know, take a straw of semen and, uh, I mean, just make sure that the the bulls that you're, you're, uh, you're collecting for AI, make sure you've got good genetics on them. And I would even, um, so, you know, the, the $600 an animal is going to be too expensive for herd management. But if the breed association, I, I believe it would be a very good decision on the part of the breed association to generate whole genome sequence on these animals that they're, uh, that they're using for AI. Uh, if you're shipping a lot of straws around, right, even, even the skim sequencing that we're talking about, um, it's not going to know anything about rare alleles. And uh, however, if we have whole genome sequencing on, on you know, these animals um, that, that we're using for AI, um, we can use the imputation to know what haplotypes are being passed down and we can go back and we can see all of the genotypes that were on that sire's haplotype and have a, um, uh, you know, know exactly uh, what uh, what alleles are being passed uh, passed uh, through the generations. All right, folks, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask Dr. Kalfleisch any questions that you have. Otherwise, I'm going to keep asking them and I don't want to do that. Ted, I won't, I'll start it then. How about, you know, since the, the border is open to imports from Canada and, and even there's been some discussion about potential coming in from, say, uh, Europe, uh -huh. what's your feeling about sampling those animals that might be imported or even semen from those animals that might, might be imported? Do you feel confident that um, we've got a good enough database to be able to compare uh, yeah. European and, and Canadian genetics to North American genetics here or U.S. genetics. I, so, um, I mean, I'm I'm a I'm a little bit worried, but only a little bit worried. Our 87 markers are going to be really good for assessing parentage, and they're going to be you know. So, given a closed population, we're going to do as well as we possibly we're going to do really well with 87 markers, right? Um, but, you know, the bringing, you know, picking out which animals you're going to bring into the country to introduce, um, uh, in a big way, you probably want to know a lot more about those animals. And in fact, you probably want to know a lot more about your herd. So I, I've, I've talked with, uh, with, with Peter and with Jessica about sequencing a lot more. Uh, I've got a little bit of money to sequence, um, you know, a couple dozen more yak and where we can, we can begin to catalog genetic diversity in, in, in more animals, um, and better understand what we've, uh, what we've got in North America. And I, I think those are all things that we want to do and then compare anything that we, we bring in to, uh, uh, to, to that and, and, you know, make sure that it's sufficiently different. I mean, anybody can do anything they want to. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just a geneticist. But uh, um, if you, uh, uh, if if it's your intent to bring animals in to improve genetic diversity, there's a way to assess that, and uh, it, it's a bit of work. Peter, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, so uh, Ted, where where are we right now with the uh, skim sequencing to try to get the uh, you know the whole genotypes in a affordable way? So I've I've got a postdoc starting in a couple of weeks and a graduate student that's going to be able to start about a month or so on it. Excellent. Yeah. And um, yeah, Jessica and I and. Um, Danielle, I hope to get with you to so we can get the optimal uh, diversified animals to to study. 
And um, I just want to echo I, it, it's so, I think it's super important if, if we are going to import any new germplasm that we get whole genome sequencing and pay the 600 bucks. And uh, so we know really what we're getting and uh, what we're going to be dealing with if we import. Peter, I think I think that's a really good comment to to know what we what we could be importing to see if it's going to improve genetic diversity at all or if it's going to actually cause us to go the other way, right? Yeah, ex exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, so since 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 you guys have gotten AI to work, I mean, you can you can ship a lot of straws of semen real fast and do a whole bunch of damage real fast. Uh, so, you know, getting on top of this is uh, from the beginning is a really good idea. Yeah. Well, I think we're all on board with that. Yeah. Other questions anybody has for Dr. Kalfleisch? <laughs> Danielle, go ahead. No, oh, I'm I'm not making any noise. She is. <laughs> <laughs> and those are good she noises. Wants to talk too. to you guys. <laughs> we love those noises. Oh. <laughs> yes, so Ted, I have a question. Yes, sir. Maybe it's inappropriate or whatever. Uh, so along with your work, what data should producers be collecting? What phenotypical data should they be collecting that I think you'll need at some point uh, to begin sort of matching, you know, uh, what's going on phenotypically with what you're seeing in the genome or different places in it? So what would you like us to be doing? So that the day, so you're not sitting there. Well, I've got it running, but I don't have any of this other data that I need to to see where it correl what it correlates with. Yeah. So um, that is entirely up to you all. Um, so whatever traits you think are important, if if you want to grow larger yak, then it would be weight. It would be. You know, if it's weaning weight, if it's if it's uh, what goes across the scale uh, as it's going to the uh, slaughterhouse, it, it whatever you know, if it's fiber content, whatever is important to you, those are the things that we should be measuring and recording. So, but if we don't do that, then you you kind of hit a brick wall in terms of some of the things that you would like to do. You know, in terms of improving things. There is really? nothing. That, there is nothing that can be done to improve product to to improve the traits that interest you until that data is collected. Okay, um, and that we could be doing today or yeah. yesterday, and we yeah. should be. Got it. Yeah, I mean, I and um, you know, and that that's something I'm a I'm a bit distant from. That's something that you know, you know, uh, you know, people like. Uh, People like Jeff, people like uh, Jessica, uh, will, you know, those are think those are studies that they're interested in doing. Um, right. I'm just interested. I mean, you know, the I, I I am the cog in this machine that generates as much accurate genotype data as as okay. as I can. Um, so, so a follow up on that is <clears throat> if that data is collected let's say it is being collected or will be starting tomorrow. <laughs> what kind of database needs to be set up to pop it into so it's usable for you what you want? Okay, so that, um, <clears throat> so um, it, we could start real simple, right? We could create a, a Google Doc uh, spreadsheet and and just start logging information there. Okay. Um, you know, it doesn't. It does not have to be elaborate. It's. I mean, ultimately, 
you want a relational database, right? You want something that's PostgreSQL or Oracle or MySQL or something like that, where you've got, you know, where you can build tables that um, store um, all sorts of data for you. But, you know, if there are just a couple of traits that, that you're interested in, um, then, you know, just set up an Excel and that you don't mind everybody seeing your data. Um, put up an Excel spreadsheet in uh, in Google Docs and just start recording that information. Yep. All right. I mean, I, yeah. So I have a, a somewhat similar question. Um, how many animals would it take? How many phenotypes would we have to collect? To look for certain recessive traits, like uh, let's say a short tail, for example, uh, or um, susceptibility to, oh, I don't know, oligohydramnios or something like that, obstetrical problem. Um, if we collect data on these uh, phenotypes, I mean, wouldn't it take, are we talking about hundreds to thousands of animals before we could actually find a genetic link or? to these things or or would it only be a couple dozen it, it depends entirely on the nature of the trait if you have what what we refer to as complete penetrance meaning that if you have that genotype you have that you condition have um you know 100 of the time uh then you don't need a whole lot of animals um right. if it, and that's you know that's assuming it's a monogenic trait as well right um if right. you Right. right. It's only one allele that's so, you know, the 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 best example of that is you know, the one that, you you know, well, um, is sickle cell anemia. Right. Yeah. Um, so, however, if it's a complex trait like size, um, that's going to be that's going to be hundreds of animals. Right. I right. see. Yeah. So we really don't know. I mean, like like. A short tail, for example, uh, we think it may be related to inbreeding and a double recessive, but um, we have no idea, right? What kind of penetrance uh, that that may be? We that would take a lot of work to figure that out. Maybe the Chinese have already figured that out. We just need to study Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> I don't well, think they even have the phenotypic data on that, Peter. They may not. I I don't know. Down here, we would call that fescue toxicosis. <laughs> Was that right? Yeah, interesting. Huh? Yeah, and that, so that something like that could really screw up your could could really screw up your analysis, right? If there's if if there's an environmental component to it, then then yeah, those numbers go the numbers that you need go way the hell up, and the amount of data that you need. Yeah, and I just brought that up, Peter, jokingly because of the contracted tendon, because you've got kind of three yeah. things there. You got restricted utero environment, you got actual toxins, and you got the potential for a genetic defect that increases the numbers you have to have. Right. Right. I think there's a big study going on in Ireland on the tail issue. Actually. So I don't know if they're what they're coming up with, but they were trying trying to get as much information as they could from people with that experience in their animals. So they're doing something with it. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. Was there a reason why they were putting the contracted tendon calf down instead of just splinting it? Um, I think they did try to splint it and it was so severe that it wouldn't respond. Fine. Okay. And, and, and I was gonna the, say we we see it every once in a while when we have really big calves, like yeah. forty five plus pound calves. But I mean, they those mm. are just random, you know. It's not like a certain breeding, and then and then the I mean, they're within a couple of days, they're fine of splinting. So yeah, and I think. I think that uh, the last time they said that they suspected skunk cabbage, which we don't have down here. You probably know more about skunk cabbage up there, but they suspected skunk cabbage is the first problem. But the 
fact that you've got two calves out of the same matings two years apart makes it suspicious. Makes sense. Other questions for Dr. Kautfleisch? So, so I do have a quick one, um, Ted, and I don't know if you can answer this. What is the possibility of using the beef genome to reference some traits in the yaks for these multiple allele, like growth, like milk production or milk components? We know that in the dairy, for example, that they've got a good handle on the SNPs controlling milk fat and, and those things. Is is that same general area on the chromosome going to be similar in the yak or completely different? It's probably, it, it's going to be pretty similar. Um, and, uh, hey, what's, you know, what's fun is, um, you know, we know that historically there's been introgression between cattle and yak and Hey, you know, if the if there is a uh, if if there are gene cattle genes that are floating around in yak uh, that are um, you know that are contributing to whatever trait, then they're going to be real easy to find. Um, so yes, we uh, we can absolutely you know it, it, uh, the 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 story that uh, um, Peter turned me on to about uh, hypoxia and uh, the 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 nature of the uh, convergent um, evolution there where all of these animals have found a way to break this one pathway. Um, they, they found different ways to do it, uh, but essentially it's it's produced the same phenotype that allows animals to um, uh, live at altitude uh, more successfully. Um, so, you know, the odds are whatever pathways they are in cattle that are affecting this phenotype um, those pathways are uh, driven by the same genes in yak. Excellent. Well, we are coming up on an hour. Any last questions for Dr. Kalfleisch? Peter, go ahead. Well, I, I just, there was a paper published yesterday in Nature Communications on uh, introgression of uh, cattle into yak historically in uh, Chinese, so I sent that to you. And there might be some new information there. I'm, I'm not sure, but I would love to see a, a, a good comparison with our 87 SNP panel to various populations in Tibet and China. So uh, I hope we can. I hope we can get that done. I'll just throw that out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so that's that's another reason to do uh, to push on on skim sequencing right so um mm. they sequence stuff in in china um and you know the the that test that neogen runs is neogen's test um of our 87 markers right and if you know if we if we have a database that makes skim sequencing work for yak and granted, it is a bit of a reach, uh, given that the Chinese and Tibetan yak are a different population. Uh, but um, you could generate one X coverage in China, you know, on these Chinese animals, and potentially use that for uh, imputation uh, on the uh, with the North American yak panel. <laughs> or you could just spend the six hundred dollars to, uh, you know, to sequence them straight up. That's, that's yeah, yeah. Great, Ted, you did a really nice job. Thank you so much. You really, really great educator. Well, uh, thank you very much, Peter. <laughs> it's, it's, it's wonderful to hear. And uh, it is always a genuine pleasure to talk uh, to talk to you folks. It, it really <laughs> is. Thank you very much, Ted. Really appreciate it. My, my pleasure. Um, yeah, uh, so so Jeff, if you ever need me to uh to, to, to drop in and and talk more i'm always always happy to do so excellent ted thanks for joining us tonight and uh, we really appreciate you sharing all your knowledge with everybody and like i said i will be making this a video and putting it up on youtube so i'll share that link in the future and but uh thanks again ted we certainly appreciate your time tonight and um
everybody, thanks for joining us this evening and, and taking time out of your night to join us.